This episode was made possible by my generous supporters on Patreon. Welcome to a pain. So, in the 48th issue of Shonen Jump this year, a controversy arose regarding the cover illustration of Tada Hiromura's harem comedy series, Yuna and the Haunted Hot Springs. The cover showed the titular character enjoying a hot springs bath in a pin-up pose, with her nipples censored by whited out steam, said nipples being visible if a backlight were cast on the other side of the page, craftily drawn as tapioca pearls in the tea the other girls were enjoying. On October 28th, Sachiko Ishikawa, a Japanese-German feminist writer and translator brought up in Catalonia and currently living in Japan, tweeted out a thread in which she posted that, uh, yeah, maybe preteens shouldn't have access to, a uh, literal porn. This prompted the responses of angry fanboys who felt the anime titties were being taken away. Since I'm not precisely great at timing my videos well and gaming the algorithm, the issue has since died down. Although so much the better since we here in the manga Twitterland live in the free market bloody place of ideas in which the currency is attention. Since, uh, the responses did get considerably spicy, and intentionally so, so that the far-right voices would inevitably be platformed in mainstream and in Twitter spaces, using all the techniques documented by the alt-right playbook. Controlling the conversation, making short quippy accusations and moving the goalposts, adopting the language of woke spaces to sow disarray within, most notably in an army of trolls accusing Ishikawa of racism against Japan, internalised racism in fact because of a hyperbolic tweet she made, mirroring the olden days of Gamergate, just because a woman wanted to have an opinion about women's representation on Twitter.com. All the while the same crowd ignored the actual racism going on around her, and as the girl posts keep getting moved, the discourse keeps getting derailed until the only option left is to disengage. Only English Twitter talks about the Unicover, no one in Japan does. Oh, they do? Well, that's just the Western influence of the SJW crowd. That's just Ishikawa being not Japanese enough. No true manga fan would bring politics into manga discussion, would they now? Would they now? So around June 2017, apparently Shonen Jump lost its mind and thought, hey, remember that very popular manga about making manga we had, Bakuman? What if we took the least interesting part of it, the weird relationship the main couple had, when they could only communicate by phone, and base the entire premise of a jump start around it? Well, there once was a child named Tsunehiro Date, who decided to take that premise, mix it up with the dash of nice guys and the drop of the black pill. The result being Cross Account, a series of 28 chapters that lasted until January 15th, 2018. Ah, oh, it! I could have, I could have released this episode uh, a couple of days ago, and it would be the, it would be the anniversary, the second year anniversary. Ah, oh, damn it! Ah, oh, bloody hell! <laughs> this is why I will never reach 3,000 subscribers like Mr. Harmful. I will never be a social media. <laughs> Kill me. <laughs> the manga had never had much success before Cross Account, nor have they since. In the first series, Tokyo Wonder Boys, they were credited as the artists working alongside the writer Kento Shimoyama. This high school football manga was first published as a one shot in 2012, and after two years, it got a 10 chapter serialization. In 2015, they published a solo one shot Gachipin. Uh, shonen romance manga, and they seem to continue that trend on alongside Haruyo Koi, a uh, two shot that they both wrote and drew the following year. And then there was this shit. Daichi Tamanashi, aka Mr. Harmless, is a super average boy living a super average life. He's so average that no one around him seems. <laughs> He's so average that no one around him seems to even care he exists. However, he's a secret social media star with an account that has over 3,000 followers. Or, as it's known on YouTube, a failed channel. <laughs> I forgot how much this manga's premise sucks nuts. So yeah, having built a small brand of shonen edgy romance, they had also adopted every single bloody cliché that comes with it. 
the self-insert everyman protagonist with whom everyone can identify, uh, with his secret Twitter otaku persona, uh, even further playing into the young weeps' hunger for wish fulfillment and validation that the pretty common interests make them in any way special. Now, I admit, I have missed out on reading the series when it first came out in the three-chapter Jumpstart run. Manga Plus wasn't a thing back in 2017, while the Shonen Jump app was limited regionally to the Anglosphere, and still is. And uh, I didn't uh, know how VPNs worked until Jeff Ruberg was so kind to tell me there's a way. So, I have been told there is something that sets Daichi apart from the typical harem protagonist, which is... This is it. The girls at my school don't see me as a boy. That's how I got this nickname, Mr. Harmless. Oh, come on, girls, give me a break. Don't you realize I'm staring at you with this pervy gaze? Oh, oh, what sets him apart is that he wants to be seen as a sexual predator by the girls because this is how he defines masculinity. <laughs> Yay! So yeah, this is our relatable protagonist, a bloke who exhibits the conservative hatred of consent so much, so much that when he is literally allowed by a whole class of girls to see them in the underwear, uh, he is so angry, so very angry that they don't see him as a threat. He considers it a point of honor as a man that they recognize him as, as such, as a threat, and simply hates the fact that his childhood friend Mayo casually squeezes his face with the thighs. What? What? He's a boy too. Isn't it a bad idea to let him touch your e-cup? <laughs> yes, this seems like a n totally normal thing to say, like ordinary people do. So yeah, this is Mr. Harmless, or Mr. Harmful, as he wants to be called on his vent account, where he bitches about normies, and how they and otakus like him will both turn into skeletons, so spread your tail from dawn till dusk upon the stormy seas. yo ho ho, -ho yo ho ho I beg your pardon. So you would think that this is a setup for a character arc that will make Mr. Harmful re-examine his views on masculinity, that he would, uh, that he would consider that, um, maybe how his wish to be treated as a healthy boy, uh, which I remind you in his eyes is the same to be treated as a potential sexual predator, is a, m maybe not as healthy as he thinks it is. So, often in storytelling, we talk about the protagonist's wants and needs, and how they set out on the quest to accomplish the former, but through the journey, they discover that they need something else entirely. But this is cross account, so, so his wants are his needs, and his desire to be seen as a predator is validated. Oh boy! Thank you, my non normie friends across the planet! Now, social media has become Daichi's source of support and comfort. Oh great, because getting stuck in a feedback loop where people constantly validate your hatred of others is miles better than therapy for you. R slash brain cells, here we go! So Elliot Roger here gets a Twitter friend he gets very close to uh, as he finds out that lies are very similar. He sounds like a nice guy, m'lady. Mr. Harmful tells Poophead, as the friend is called, about his first and only crush, Nanoka Satsuki, the idol who he was in love with since middle school. Oh boy, oh, oh boy, can't wait to see how we can romanticize that. And oh, he tells them how he suffers so, not being able to live truly as an otaku, the pages dripping with the martyr complex of gamers and nerds being the most oppressed minority. Oh, oh, but Mr. Harmful's also not like the other nerds who sneak up on childhood friend to take pictures of her while she's in th the shower. Uh, yeah, th that happens. Should I go and help her now? Wait, but... That girl is such a normie. Is an outcast like me even allowed to save her? Ugh. Jesus. This is so chilling. One of the character-defining moments of our protagonist is that he wants to walk away from his best friend being sexually assaulted. Oh, but don't worry, he comes back, only after making this entire moment about him, steering any attention from the victim of the assault.
You make yourself believe that you're not good enough. You're running away from who you are. That's what makes you no good. You should be strong and face it. <laughs> yeah, that's it, Mr. Harmful. You're a big, strong, rational big boy. You can barge in with your big old phallic fire extinguisher and be the three bad nerds with a phone as a good nerd with a... W w wait, what? B b back up. This phone is the latest model and it can take photos in the dark. Yep. You mean like any phone with a flash? Why you, would you make a manga heavily featuring the phones if you don't know how phones these days work? What fucking boomer wrote this? Jesus Christ! You guys, if you are an otaku, you've at least played a dating sim before, right? One wrong choice and you steer off the main route. Real life is the same as dating sims. <laughs> oh, oh, I can't. Oh, you can't make this up. Real life is the same as dating sims. Oh, I love it. It's it, it's like Undyne's anime is real, but really, really bad. So 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 he beats them up, and and then he goes, "Oh, I'm a man now. I can't leave a girl who's." In trouble alone, because yes, this was always about him, and totally changes the childhood friend's opinion about him now. And uh, and oh oh oh, uh, the next day he goes back to class, and everyone's like, "Wow, you're so cool and manly, MC Coon." And uh, and the childhood friend now has a secret crush on him, and he doesn't have to hide that he's an otaku now. Uh, wow, cool, cool. And uh, oh oh, be best of all, poophead's like. Wow, you're you're so amazing, Mr. Harmful. You made a huge step by manning up, and and then oh boy, it turns out that Mr. Harmful's online best friend Poophead is in fact Nanotka Satsuki, the idol he's been in love with since middle school. <laughs> you know what they say: real life is the same as dating. Yeah, now I think I know what fucking boomer wrote. There's a boomer who's somehow also 14. God, I don't blame this chapter for its short-lived infamy. This is a treasure trove of badness. The room and my immortal be damned. So now the question remains, how can the follow-up reach the same lows? So next chapter... Mark my words, you stupid girls who treat me like a bug. Every single man in the world is essentially a predator in his head. But still... My sincere gratitude for the great view. Sir, this is a Wensleydales. <laughs> oh god, in one line, in one line this manga has managed to sink even deeper, I love it. Uh, I almost wish this bloke were a real person so I could check how many times he's responded to tweets about sexual assault with hashtag not all men. Uh, despite writing this, He's not afraid to tell it like it is, and he's a real man, a predator, except when he's also super kind and everything, uh, whenever the story needs him to be treated that way. The Manosphere is a world of contradiction which we need to be blind to in order to believe Mr. Harmful's idle love interest would admire him, instead of, you know, finding him dangerous or pathetic. Speaking of which, soon after we get to know more of Poophead, who's having a bikini photo shoot? Because of her clean and flowery image, she's gained a lot of support from people of all ages and genders, making her the number one most popular female star. Heh, <laughs> suck it, Miku. <laughs> mm, okay, here comes the romanticizing. Look, you don't have to look far to discover how predatory the idol industry tends to be, with a rather shady past and pretty murky present. Its cultivation of obsessive fans, its encouragement of grown men lasting over little girls, its drive to have the idols' lives be fully controlled by their agencies, and essentially feel like they belong to the fans, is all bloody despicable and the series is wrong to do nothing but glamorize it. At first it appears that uh, that one aspect of idol culture is going to be criticised in particular, namely the idealisation of idols as perfect, innocent girls that need to be romantically available to crowds of men and thus can't be in a relationship, especially given that over the course of the story, uh, Sasaki is uh, supposed to, you know, grow into a relationship. 
but as the RPG manga reveals when describing the changes the idol image underwent during the 90s and 2000s, this just falls in line with what the agencies want fans to think of idols nowadays anyway, that they're just everyday people who happen to be talented and hardworking as the target audience became adult male otakus. And to be honest, isn't it just more bloody wish fulfillment to say, oh, look, this perfect and innocent actress who needs to uphold her image in public will, ac ac will actually reveal her true personality to you and you only, and, and she is actually a secret gamer girl who shares all your hobbies and interests. The fairest known to the world is the actress Nanoka Satsuki, is the complete opposite of my true self, who is gloomy, lazy, and a super otaku. Oh, fuck off, cross account, you're on your insult pandering. God, they even make her laziness so non threatening to a perfect image since she counts carries so she'll always take care of a conventionally perfect figure. Oh, God, it's pathetic. It's only when I'm talking with you that I don't feel alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't see what thoughts this could put into the mind of the idol industry fan base. That's right, Rita. You and you are the only secret safe space to your idol. Don't look into your parasocial relationships and how they might be harmful for everyone involved. Well, at least they, the second chapter doesn't romanticize the handshake events where, where some people get to meet the idols and go all stabby stabby when they don't appreciate them enough. No. The third chapter does that. Ever since I saw your first movie in theaters, I've been a real big fan of yours. I really like your smile. <laughs> Jeez, is that guy confessing to her for real? That's dumb. A handshake event? Is he that stupid? Even though the <laughs> Even though the person you like is not the real me, but rather as an actress r r r r <laughs> Thanks to that, I could begin to love my actress self. You are the first person who ever said anything like that to me. Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely, you're just that special, Mr. Harmful. I'm sure this is the first confession to ever occur at a handshake event. It's so fortunate that no other idol has to deal with this, for sure. I, I, I can't, I'm running out of ways to say this. This manga is pandering to the most pathetic childish desires. It's spreading false hope to young men that, oh, you're gonna meet your parasocial idol and they're gonna be ever so grateful to meet you. Uh, you will make the day because you are the special boy they secretly like. This is terrible for both idols and fans alike and only serves to glamorize the idol culture the industry profits off of. Don't wait for a miracle to happen. You gotta make it happen. Never give up, and maybe one day you might be able to see her again! Don't encourage their obsession, Jesus, that, that's like the worst thing you can do! Real life is the same as dating sims. And thus ended the jumpstart run. It's it's daft, it's bloody awful, and I'm glad it never continued. When I first heard about the series, I was morbidly curious about it, thinking I could appreciate it in a so bad it's good kind of way. But but now I'm glad it didn't get a following. I'm glad as few people have heard about it as possible. Which is why I'm making a probably three long hour video. I don't know uh, about it to make it less popular. Obviously. Ah, uh, fucking kill me, people are still going to see this Rise of Skywalker a second time despite most critics being in agreement of its poor quality. Ah, oh, well, bollocks, you can, you just can't win with outrage marketing, can you? No matter what, you criticize Disney win, so maybe they should invest in Cross Account as well. Curse you 2010's so bad it's good consumption culture for creating this drive in me and millions of other people. Now I'm kind of hoping this doesn't get any traction. You know how it goes, I will say thing bad, uh, other people will say thing good, and and people who never have taken any interest in thing will now go, oh, I guess people are talking about the thing, better check the thing out, thing. No, I'm just kidding, like, like share and subscribe, ring that bell, I, I want to keep making these. 
So yeah, despite the harmful in nature of the manga, I still have this morbid curiosity. So what happened to this rubbish pile and jump after its English release had ended? Unfortunately, I don't understand Japanese, and there is no official volume release in English. So I'm I'm sorry to say. Uh, Okay, uh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, alright? I, I broke one of my rules and uh, I checked this canister, okay? I, I, I know, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, but come on guys, it's cross account. Even if there were official release, would you want me to support it? So, this is cross account chapters 4 through 28, bonus lighting round. Chapter 4 Mr. Harmful thinks childhood friend has an irrational hatred of men now. Also, turns out he doesn't like being seen as a predator either. Chapter 5 Mr. Harmful asks childhood friend if she has someone she likes on behalf of his classmates and continues her to be an oblivious prick. Chapter 6 Childhood friend and Mr. Harmful need to organize a field trip together, but she's still angry with him and she apologizes for being irrational. What? Chapter 7 Lesbian phobic and transphobic jokes. Yay! Chapter 8 A date with childhood friend Nick is shot all around. Chapter 9 Mr. Harvel protects childhood friend's belly button from thunder. What? Chapter 10 Poopa doesn't know how to smile anymore because she can't contact her insult friend. But what? She falls into her the hot springs bath with her. Chapter 11 The other girls join the bath. Childhood friend always appears, but first in the panel, Kill me. Chapter 12. Oh god, the bath keeps going. Childhood friends admit her feeling and they leave. What? Chapter 13. Poophead nurses him back to health and he sees her uh, uh, taco side. Chapter 12. Chapter 14, Childhood Friends is jealous of Poophead. Chapter 15, they want to meet. Chapter 16, Poophead goes in drag to meet Mr. Harmful. This feels a lot like the time I went to London to see Hoven and Caster, except they didn't cover it on me out of nowhere. Chapter 17, hey, you look similar to my idol crush. Are you perhaps her relative? The fuck? Chapter 18. Poophead realizes she has come to love Mr. Harmful, but have we mentioned that she's a super saw yet? Uh, uh, have we? Have we? Chapter 19. Mr. Harmful goes to see childhood friend and she confesses. Chapter 20. Poophead tells Mr. Harmful to go out with childhood friend. Okay, chapter 21. Okay, sure, study group hijinks. Chapter 22. Childhood friend has a secret account too. Chapter 23. Don't worry, man babies. Having feelings for idols and basing important life choices on those feelings is a completely healthy thing to do. Chapter 24. Wow, Poophead has been totally gaslit by her mum into believing she likes her idol life, hasn't she? Chapter 25. Oh, fuck off. Chapter 26. Oh, great! Trap joke, as if it couldn't get any worse! Chapter 27. Are you serious? It took you this long to notice she was lying to you by rejecting you for your own good? Why does this series need to rely on these obvious facial giveaways when the characters could just examine each other's behaviors unless the author doesn't know how real people behave? Because that, that does explain a lot, doesn't it? Or is it just the theme of masks and again? Oh, fuck it. Chapter 28. I guess they will always be connected after all. Chapter 28.5. Don't worry, nice guy. You will get out of that friend zone and go to uni together with your idol crush. Uh, we even have to fuck up the almost decent bittersweet ending because you entitled pricks need to be coddled with a happily ever after. So... Does this continuation save cross account in my eyes in any way? Now, it's still got pretty awful messages that pander to chuds that hardly need pandering to. And even if the pacing does the job well with the story it's given, the dialogue is often pretentious and cliche ridden while the humour leaves a lot to be deserved. It should be highlighted that the byproduct of this immature male gaze fantasy bullshit is, and I say it with utmost caution knowing what the comment section is going to become if it gets any traction, the inability to realistically portray the emotional life of its female characters in a series that strives for realism. 
In the first chapter, childhood friend is sexually assaulted and, as I alluded to, suffers no trauma from the encounter. In the next chapter, uh, the only change in her character is that she's able to look at Mr. Harful as a man. She serves two purposes in the story. Firstly, to validate our chivalrous nice guy, and secondly, to be the eye candy in an exploitative sexual assault scene. Even if you scoff at the moral argument here, considering you are a rational big boy that uses reason and logic in your critical analysis, I'm sure you will agree that in the type of story Dato was trying to make, that's just plain bad writing. You know, when everything revolves around how the main character feels and uh, the other character's turmoil is just a tool for his growth. That's... that's not good, right? It doesn't make me care about your protagonist if they're the only human being in your story. And also if he's a garbage human being in general, but that's beside the point. It's almost like this were appealing to a certain type of ideology that considers everyone around the straight cis man a soulless robot with no thought process. Nah, I can't put my finger on it. So, this is by no means the worst example of a manga using a sexual assault scene in an exploitative way, or its female characters in an exploitative way. So, why am I talking about this? It's because of how mimetic the manga po podcasting community raging about it ha became in 2017. Well, partly, but mostly because with its particularly egregious messages, it has become emblematic of the larger systemic problem of the persistent lack of female representation in the Shonen Jump editorial department, and thus women having no control over how women are represented in Jump manga. That's right, we're doing it folks, we're bringing this back full circle! And yeah, for those of you who are here for s some fun cross-account rant times, this is as far as it goes. Now I'm gonna talk about some political stuff resulting from all this now. If you got this far, thank you for watching, like and subscribe, support me on Patreon and all that. Uh, the next goal is... the next big goal is a Demon Slayer retrospective and we're about halfway there, so... so yeah. Uh, bye bye. But in case you wanted to see more of my venting and... Uh, try to figure out if there's a point to be made here alongside me, then uh, off we go on, on our adventure. <laughs> As said before, the controversy around the Yuna cover page brought to light several issues about manga and women's representation. Uh, firstly, softcore porn being accessible to children in Japan. Secondly, the objectification of women shaping others' perception of them, and their perception of themselves, and that perception influencing how Japanese women are treated in their country, whether de jour or de facto. I must admit, I didn't think Ishikawa chose the best target among harmful jump manga, which to be fair was inevitable with the way the Twitter algorithm works. The Yuna thing went viral since it was obvious and blatant, while there are other series who are much more tame but thus much stronger with more subtle conservative messaging, like Samurai 8. Yuna, meanwhile, is horny, and obviously inappropriately so for a magazine aimed at children, there's no denying that, but it doesn't enforce gender roles in the same way Samurai 8 or Cross Account do. In addition, taking on the pornographic series as the representative of sexism in the manga industry makes Ishikawa's problems with it easy to straw man and easy to misrepresent. It conflates the two issues and makes it easy for Ishikawa's opponents to manipulate the narrative so that it looks like everyone who wants there to be more women editors um, is a prude. So while I agree with the majority of her claims, I wish they had been worded differently in a sense. However, even without explicit cognitive function of the text that seeks to establish some standard of gender roles, like any other piece of media, Yuna and the Haunted Hot Springs has an effect on how women are seen and continue to be seen, because it stars female characters and they are chosen to be portrayed as in a certain way by authors who have already been brought up accepting and thus perpetuating these gender roles. Hikari Sugisaki's paper on gender roles in manga exemplifies this in the context of shoujo manga. Critics, mangaka and editors all define shoujo manga as manga catered to what girls like, and since most female mangaka come out of those who read shoujo, there is a pre-existing idea of what girls should like that is imposed into the manga itself. Therefore, 
depicting authentic women's lives and experiences, predominantly to girls and women, only creates a feedback loop where the media only impresses upon women and girls their role and situation in society, doing nothing to change the situation. In order to create something new, in order to break stereotypical gender moulds, one must be aware of the inherent systems in place that perpetuate oppression, and from there start producing culture in such a way that subvert those systems. So, even speaking as someone who can enjoy Yuna and the Haunted Hot Springs, I still believe Ishikawa has a point and has a right to be frustrated at the representation she's given. And, frankly, so can you if you enjoy the series like I do. After all, as the Dark Mother says, it's both possible and even necessary to simultaneously enjoy media while also being critical of its more problematic or pernicious aspects. But in the end, once again, just the fact that Yuna, or Cross Account for that matter, shouldn't be shown to young kids is reason enough for this thread, you know, not being dogpiled as it did. The alt-right voices that did the dogpiling had planted themselves within the Phantom and created several distractors that were meant to take the attention away from these issues while taking the outrage on Ishikawa herself. These distractors were not meant to progress the debate but instead to move the goalpost thereof. These distractors were number 1. Western Influence the idea that any concerns people have about women's rights or women's representation in media are voiced purely by Western manga fans, while Japan remains a conservative ethnostate paradise where feminism is non-existent. This is a common narrative aimed at the Western left who might be concerned about women's issues in Japan, but don't want to be the post-colonial wankers who speak over Japanese women, and thus they disassociate themselves from the discourse altogether. This completely ignores the fact that Japanese women do, in fact, speak out about sexual violence, discrimination in the workplace, and yes, the Yuna controversy. Only the anti-SJLW crowd calls them not Japanese enough when they do, and speak over them while not being from Japan themselves. It's not like the alt-right wankers call themselves the Western influence, though. By transforming the argument into a nature versus nurture narrative, they made themselves the defenders of their own image of naturally unchanging Japan. This is misleading on purpose. Japan changes. Reactionary politics also affects it. Dig deeper. Don't speak over Japanese women and minorities, but also don't shy away from the discourse because a troll told you to. Number 2. Internalized Racism Ah, oh, have the sneaky left already convinced you that Japanese feminists exist? Well, what if we told you they are in fact racist? Against themselves, that's right. Don't believe us? Here we've picked apart uh, the out-of-context sentences they tweeted out out of frustration and implied it was the main point of the argument, then moved the goalposts of the conversation until the original point was barely recognisable. How could you support this person? Bah! Just like with the Western influence narrative, this appears to be meant to turn the left against their own, and is a tactic that should be looked out for. People who criticise their own country because they wanted to improve, because they have frustrated with it, don't have internalised racism because that's not what internalised racism is. It's not trying to be one of the good ones and sucking up to the oppressors in hope of better treatment, it's pointing out the oppression within your own community. The alt-right adopting the language of woke spaces to sow disarray within is a tale as old as time and is never a good faith argument. Number 3. It's just a comic, bro. You're thinking too much about it, just turn your brain off and don't think about media at all. Just calm down, even if you were calm in the first place. It's just fiction, it just really describes reality. It's not like the media we consume affects us in any way. Except it totally does, let's go back to Sugisaki's study, do I, don't we? In general, manga holds affective power on its readers that motivates them into action in ways that have significant influences on economy, culture, as well as people's day-to-day -day life. For example, the traditional board game Go, whose professional society was on the decline, had tens of thousands of children start signing up for classes after a manga whose story plot centred around Go became popular. More serious examples include an instance in Belgium in 2007 where a body was found with a note that read Watashi wa kira desu, with a romanized misspelling of the verb desu or I am kira. So yeah, it's just a comic, and yes, it cannot be separated from the politics that allow its existence, that influence its themes and that emerge from the response to it. 
This is precisely why, yes, random commenter, I am gonna discuss politics in manga in future videos, and omitting these thoughts from my analysis and interpretation would be disingenuous. Number 4. The manga industry is woke, actually. Getting this type of response while making mistake of engaging in this public debate was one of the primary reasons why I decided to put these thoughts together in a video. No, the existence of a trans character as a protagonist of a manga does not mean that the manga industry is a particularly trans-friendly environment. Nor does the existence of female mangaka mean that women are in control of female representation in manga across demographics. After all, the production of mangaka involves editors, and 75-80% to 80 of these editors in shoujo manga are men. Oh yeah, and if you think it's bad in shoujo, hmm, let's imagine how it is in Shonen Jump. Actually, we don't need to imagine since, uh, well, an interview came out. There is indeed another recent controversy, which is not directly related to this unit controversy, but it does also concern Shonen Jump's treatment of women, but in this case, real-life women specifically, because recently, you know, an anonymous Twitter user sparked a conversation when they spoke of Shueisha visiting their university and she asked the question, can women become editors at Shonen Jumps? And Shueisha HR allegedly said, it's not without precedent, but you have to understand the hearts of boys. This caused a kerfuffle after the tweet was published in Japan um, and circulated Japanese Twitter. So Huffington Post Japan reached out to Shueisha and confirmed that this was the company's official stance towards hiring female editors. And Shueisha's full statement to the Huffington Post reads as follows. Our company conducts seminars at a number of university campuses regarding the matter of female editors at Jump. Our statement is as follows. It is not unprecedented. There are women at Jump Plus and publications like Young Jump have had female editors in the past. Women's fashion magazines need people who understand women's fashion regardless of gender. So for Shonen manga, it is important to understand the hearts of boys. Also, new recruits to the company are not selected based on the department. We hire suitable people for the company as a whole, and after they have joined, they are assigned to a place that suits them. Regarding the state we made above, we cannot answer any questions regarding the date or the name of the university that it took place in. So, very obviously from that PR statement, they didn't actually say or make it clear whether or not women can become editors in Weekly Shonen Jump. They sidestepped the question by saying, it's not like we haven't had women editors on our Shonen and Jump related series in the four, but, you know, regards to Shonen manga, it's important to understand Hearts of Boys. Essentially, they're saying it is up to them to judge whether the people they hire to be editors, quote unquote, understand the Hearts of Boys. And apparently in the last 50 years, they have judged that none of the women they have hired to be editors have understood the Hearts of Boys enough to be an editor at a Weekly Shonen Jump, it seems. And, of course, this has been talked about before, their stance on the fact there has never been a woman in the history of Shonen Jump's editorial department. Again, there was an interview with TBS last October where Deputy Chief Onoshi stated that, you know, very frankly stated that Shonen Jump has never had a female editor in its history and described the workplace as a boys-only high school. And then up on the question of what it'd be like to work with, with women in the editorial department. They discussed it mostly in terms of how they would be gratified to work with women, like being scolded or praised by women and joked about, oh, how we'd get so many new puns out of it. They weren't really taking the idea seriously. It was very dismissive of the idea. And of course, in the right way to make jump, this question was also addressed when then... Deputy Editor-in-Chief uh, Soichi Aida said, There are no female editors working at the magazine because Jump's main target is boys about middle school age. And they basically were very firm in that manga, it seemed, about the fact that there are no women working here. And we're proud there are no women working here because Shonen Jump is for boys. And 
if I were editor in chief, I'd make the department even more manly. So really, they don't take the idea of women working in Shonen Jump editorial seriously, and they aren't really concerned with the fact that over 50 years, they have not so, here we are in the year of 2020, assuming boys as a collective have a type of heart that women just don't understand. Here we are in 2020, ignoring that Shonen Jump, despite having young boys as the target demographic, has had girls and women as roughly half its readers for decades. Here we are denying women work as editors because of a superstition in a magazine read by millions of women around the world. Here we are in the future, and it's wrong! There are many ways you could counter this philosophy. You should hire female and non-binary editors since, by your own logic, you also need to understand the hearts of girls. Not only because girls read Shonen Jump, but also because girls are in Shonen Jump as characters, and also need to be understood by male readers and have believable personalities and emotional journeys. And you won't have that when you have an insulated boys club where women have little to no degree of control in how they're portrayed. And most of all because these male readers will grow up and meet women in their lives, whom they won't think as people with their own thoughts and emotional lives that should be recognized and respected, but as objects who live only in relation to them. Just like you, when you only thought about the prospect of your own pleasure from your interactions with women when confronted with the thought of having them in your workplace. So yeah, even for the good of the boys reading your magazine, you should hire female editors. Because as long as this goes on, this one narrow target demographic that in no way represents the fandom as a whole, will always feel entitled to have this pathetic, degrading wish fulfillment fantasy pandered to them. As long as this goes on, the manga and anime community will always have a sexism problem, a pedophilia problem, a fascism problem. As long as this goes on, we'll have hot garbage like cross account. So, this has been an eventful time. I launched my Patreon campaign in 2019, and I'm really excited that I can close this year very nearly with reaching my first goal. I've got plenty more scripts planned out that I can't wait to work on. I need to do some features uh, on new as well as cancelled jump starts. Uh, Jesus, that's a lot of those. I want to do a video essay on Blue Flag since uh, it's ending soon. Uh, Samurai 8 episodes, this will probably be a big one. Uh, one. One more My Hero Academia one and Dr. Stone one. And I've got plenty more patron goals that I hope to reach this year, like a Demon Slayer and Food Rose retrospective. And if you'd like to help me reach that, go to patreon.com slash Cheddar. Link below, we have like a bajillion patron exclusive anime watch through vlogs right now for you, uh, if you're interested in that. Or at least I think they're already there, if not they should soon arrive. Thank you ever so much if you support me already, and if you can't afford it, I'd greatly appreciate it if you shared this video around on social media, or subscribe to my channel, since the YouTube algorithm is also hot garbage. And here's why.